Hey guys, I have all these videos on this channel that are centered around being prepared for hunts, but all of that takes time. And right now guys, we don't have time. Elk and deer archery seasons have already started or they're gonna start in a matter of hours in most areas. But here's the deal guys, you can still double or triple your effectiveness on a hunt tomorrow, the next day, or within a couple weeks from now if you follow some of the advice I'm gonna roll out in this video. Most of this stuff can be implemented as a mind exercise on your drive to your hunt. Or in the most demanding cases, towards the end I'll kinda give a few pieces of action advice, those might take you a max of one to one and a half hours. If you have no clue who I am, I don't blame you at all. My name's Cliff Gray and I spent the past decade outfitting some of the most remote wilderness in North America. My insights and strategies in these videos is just based on that data set and experience. All I hope is that you get some value from them. If you like my videos, do me a great big favor and subscribe to the channel and get on my newsletter at PursuitWithCliff.com. All right guys, let's jump right in here. Okay, so first a framework to think about in this situation. First, acknowledge that your lack of preparation, the lack of working on your physical fitness, your marksmanship, your familiarity with the area, your calling, any and all of those tactical skill sets. That's reduced your effectiveness for this upcoming hunt. That's a fact, so just acknowledge it. Prepare better next time. But also acknowledge that there are choices that you can still make and strategies that you can implement that are, in many ways, more important than all of that preparation combined. First, the mental things that you can do right now. One, commit to not going in to a hunt already defeated. That is idiotic at this point. If you do that, you're wasting your time, money, and effort. This is super common. I've heard it a thousand times on the phone right before people are coming for hunts. As a guy jumps out of his truck at my old hunting lodge on arrival, it's common for guys to just show up already defeated, and they verbalize it. Statistically, this is irrational. Preparation matters, but when you're talking about the volatility and variability of these OTC elk hunts, so does luck. Luck matters a lot. You could have done zero prep and you could still get dealt pocket aces. It's not an excuse, guys, but it's a fact that luck still matters, so you got a chance. The second part of the mental game here, guys, is make the commitment to hunt the prime hours all the days of your hunt for the duration of the hunt. Yeah, I know you're thinking like, that's freaking obvious. Well, I've lived the data set, guys. And 75% of elk hunters, or really any hunters operating out of a camp environment, are not truly hunting for the duration. They take a morning off here, they take an afternoon off there, they walk back to camp 40 minutes before dark. If you are elk hunting, and this goes for a lot of other species too, it's easy to define. The guideline, guys, is be at a glassing spot, a good glassing spot, 15 to 20 minutes before first shooting light. And then, at, at night, make sure that you don't start walking home until you need your headlamp. You can glass with that, even a little bit after shooting light, you can glass and you might pick up a game animal that you can hunt the next day. I'm not saying you gotta hunt the whole day, like in between those periods of time. There's flexibility midday, but you need to commit to hunting those prime morning hours and those prime uh, hours at night. On a five day hunt, you really have 10 hunts, right? You got your morning hunt, your afternoon hunt, morning hunt, afternoon hunt. If you go back to camp one hour before dark, one day, you essentially reduce your entire hunt uh, hunt's effectiveness by 10%. I'm not sure that preparation of losing 20 or 30 pounds is gonna in increase a hunter's effectiveness by 10%. So think about those numbers, guys. You can actually end up unprepared for hunts for a ton of legitimate reasons. You know, you can be offered a tag that was returned. You could have had unexpected work travel. You had a kid during the months of preparation, stuff like that, just life stuff, right? There are absolutely hunts that I've done that I was totally unprepared for. So I know in my audience on this channel, there's a ton of people that probably have advice for this situation. So let us know, guys. The third thing to think about, guys, is you do need to adjust your tactics based on your lack of preparation. I hate saying this, because in other avenues of life, you know, other hobbies I enjoy, pushing yourself to the furthest limit possible is a good thing. I truly believe that. But with a week-long backpack hunt in elk country or a mule deer hunt, you know, up out of a wall tent, really remote in, it isn't. 
particularly if you're showing up fat and out of shape. Combining the cat camp environment, you know, the sleep depth that goes along with that, all those variables, it makes it harder to physically recover on these hunts. So one of the worst things an out of shape person, you know, somebody who's just underprepared on the physical front can do is push it over the limit on these hunts, particularly during the first 48 hours of the hunt or during a hunt that involves altitude. Check out my video, Elk Hunting at Altitude. I'll stick a link up here, guys. You can check it out. That, I cover this stuff a lot, and I'll give you some ways to mitigate that particular issue. That's, that advice in that video applies more so if you're a little unprepared or a lot un underprepared on the physical front. So go check it out. But back to the point here, guys. Typically, this situation arises the same way. It's a guy that says, I'm going to offset my lack of preparation with, you know, grit, balls, just this magical mental state I can get myself in. The reality is, guys, that's probably not going to happen. If you kick the shit out of yourself up in the mountains, much of the physiological things that occur will manifest in higher chances of quitting altogether and or weakening you on the first point I made, hunting all the prime hours, right? You're going to want to sleep in. You're only going to get, get back to camp early, all of those things. So what does it look like to adjust? Instead of glassing out that far glassing point out there, I'm going to go to this glassing point that's in closer proximity to camp. Instead of putting on 10 miles of romping around midday, I'm going to sit this wallow or I'm going to sit that trail crossing. Instead of roaming around all over, running ridge lines and doing locate bugles, I'm going to find some fresh localized elk sign and try some cold call-in setups. The hunters that cover ground and grind for the bull that is callable, you know, the run and gun buglers, look at them physically. How many of those guys are 100 pounds, 90 pounds, or even 20 pounds overweight? Very few of them. On the marksmanship front, if you feel underprepared, you know, do tighter archery setups. Don't do archery setups where a bull can see you and you can also see a bull pop out at 75, 80 yards. Do setups with a, where the bull is going to pop out at 30 yards. A lot of times this is, this is hard for guys to do because they don't want to give up the fact that you know they want to see you further they want to you know they want to see that bull further but you have to realize that if you're not prepared to shoot 75 or 80 yards you have to give up your your ability to see the bull as he comes in and instead adjust your tactics so that bull pops out within the reasonable distance of what you can shoot that's just the function of the fact that you're not quite prepared enough but don't ruin the whole thing by having setups where the bull is going to pop out at 80 yards and look for you and then bail out because he doesn't see you if you can't shoot him there. You have to adjust what you're doing to your capabilities. Analogous to that on the rifle front, don't be glassing for bears across a canyon that's 850 yards wide with no way for you to cross or approach, right? That's a waste of your time if you're not prepared to shoot that shoot that distance, okay? So if you're underprepared in that regard, you have to adjust your setups, right? Get in areas where you're 200 yards from a choke cherry run or from some oak brush to hunt those bears. Again, you may not see as many bears, but you have you're going to have to adjust your tactics to your limitations. If you do that, you're, you're going to be a whole lot more effective at actually achieving the results you're looking for. Another front, particularly this time of year, where guys feel unprepared is on their calling. So here's the deal, adjust your tactics. Two ways you can easily adjust on calling, right? First, on the actual sounds you make. Go to the low risk sounds. You know, your basic just cow chatter, you know, cows and, cows and calves talking to each other, um, cows just mewing, your basic estrus sounds. You can figure out those sounds relatively easy and they're low risk, okay? I've heard so many different variations from real elk in, in those sounds that I view them as very low risk, right? Versus like aggressive bugling, you know, run around, locate bugling. If you're not, if you don't sound like an elk, there's much more risk to that type of calling, right, in terms of the sounds. And then also, you can adjust the actual types of calls you use for the same reason, to get low, to use lower risk calls, right? So a diaphragm to me, when it comes to elk, elk hunting and elk calling, is a riskier type of call, right? Because you're controlling the pitch and you can actually, you know, kind of get erratic sounds out of that if you haven't done some preparation and practice with it, okay? So move to calls that 
how, you have a lot more control of that. You know, the just tried and true hoochie mama. You know, Phelps has got a new call out that anybody can run. And it's going to make a really, you know, a consistent low risk sound. If you're not prepared on the calling front, don't worry about it. Just adjust to those type of sounds and those type of calls. And just a note here, guys, and this should actually be motivating if you're a bit unprepared. A lot of the tactics I just mentioned are tactics that some highly prepared individuals use, even though they are more than capable, capable of taking on a broad array of approaches. It's not like the tactics I mentioned are just poorer than you know run and gun tactics or that sort of thing. It, everybody has personal choice on it, and including some highly capable people. So don't think that, oh, like, it, you know, my unpreparedness has just destroyed my chances. That's not true if you just look at the evidence out there. The real effectiveness of a guy that utilizes X type of calling versus Y type of calling over time is pretty damn marginal. But a guy that can't bugle running around bugling or a guy that can't group his rifle at 200 yards deciding to shoot 600 yards through three canyon winds, those differentials are gigantic, okay? So keep that in context, guys, and match your capabilities to the tactics you're, you're doing, all right? All right, guys, a note here on groups of hunters. I've dealt with groups of hunters a ton over the years. In groups of hunting buddies, you rarely have groups where it makes sense for everyone to hunt the same way. You know, you've got dis different personalities, age, and as it relates to this video, preparedness. So you shouldn't have a single self-conscious thought when it comes to saying, hey guys, I'm gonna sit this wallow or I'm gonna go over here where I found some sign and do a cold calling setup while you guys hike 15 miles to your glassing spot. Don't be self-conscious about that, guys. Guys, the fourth mental thing you can do is commit to managing your stress during your hunt. Go watch my video, it's called Why Hunters Quit. I'll put a link up here. It's super long-winded and goes in super detail, but it'll give you an idea how to play the stress, ga stress game on these challenging hunts. It's a spectrum. Some types of hunts, it doesn't even apply. You know, they end up being easy, fun hunts. You get great early luck. But a lot of the hunts, particularly elk hunts on easy to draw tags, that video is gonna be really re relevant, and even at this point in the game, you can prepare by just listening to it. All right, guys, so that basically covers the mental aspects of these hunts and the aspects that you can still kind of mentally prepare for even though you're low on time, all right? So before I jump into some simple, you know, low time needed actual actions you can take, if any of you guys have a piece of advice for the unprepared hunter, leave it in the comments. There are so many guys out there that watch this channel. I'm sure there are tons of experiences where you guys went on hunts way underprepared for a multitude of reasons, and you still got it done, or you learned something phenomenal during that hunt. Please let everybody know who watches this channel so they can get some value from it. So stick those stories in the comments, guys. Okay, so here are two high margin, low time commitment actions you can pull out even if you're down to just a few hours left for preparation. One, for backpack and backcountry camp hunts in particular, go online and calculate a rough estimate of the calories you're going to burn during your hunt. For most average size guys, it's going to be between 2,900 calories and 4,000, just depending on your size, amount of activity, how much weight you're carrying, that sort of thing. Take one to two hours and make daily food packets of that amount of calories. At this point, I don't really care what you put in there as calories but make sure you have them separated by day. So during your hunt, you're making sure you get enough calories. Do not further your unpreparedness by saying you're gonna grab food on the drive or you're gonna make a grocery run the night before with your cooler in the back of the truck and just throw stuff in there. Guys that do that have a 90% plus failure rate. I'm talking failure rate in terms of just finishing the hunt. If you inadvertently starve yourself out on these hunts, you're toast. And guys, you might be pressed for time, but it's not that hard. Get a bunch of Ziploc bags and go get some food. The calories are on the back and make some packets of food so you take care of yourself during your hunt. And guys, this food thing applies to a lot of the mental part of this, this, this deal I've already discussed. You've got to get calories or you're going to end up in a bad state. So that's important. Use your, even if it's, you got to stay up, for an extra hour and a half to do this, please do that, you'll get a lot of value out of it. The other piece of action advice is take half an hour on Google Earth or on X and identify the first three spots you're going to glass from during your hunt. Identify these based on your intuition of how far they are from camp 
in your current capabilities. Okay, so do that. Now find three more glassing spots that are half the distance of those glassing spots you just marked. It doesn't matter which set of glassing points you actually end up hitting on your hunt. The point is that you're going to go into a hunt with six starting points over varying distances. This gives you the start of an action plan once you get boots on the ground. All right, guys, that's it. I really think you can get some value out of those. But guys, if any of you have good last minute, super high marginal value, but low time commitment suggestions, please leave them in the comments for everyone. Please like the video and subscribe. It helps me out a ton. Thanks and good luck, guys.